it's not only the weather. The students are wonderful. They're, it's, to read um, Catherine and Augustine and Dante with um, many, many of them Protestant students who are very much more biblically literate than the Catholic students I used to have, not surprisingly, um, is really a wonderful treat. So we did Augustine, and then we did Catherine, and this, my students keep what's called a commonplace book, where they write their favorite passages and um, questions about the text. Um, any of you who've ever done it, been in a great books circle, this is traditional great book stuff. And so, uh, and I encourage them to draw, to visualize what they're reading. And so Catherine, when she writes about the circle of self-knowledge, a couple of my students drew it in their commonplace books, so we put it up on the board. Um, it's on the handout. Maybe, you know what, I'm going to come back to this okay. until, uh, and wait. Okay, so I'll come back to that when you have the handout. Eventually, Catherine's parents um, realized that her, uh, you know, her vocation was genuine, and they, got, they were worn down and, and um, allowed her to join the Dominicans, not as a professed nun, but as something called um, a mentalata. Uh, the mentalatas were third order, which would be, right, a, um, what's Dorothy, what do you call it? She's a lay, a lay associate, yeah. or a, um, right. So she, she didn't become fully professed as a nun, but um, joined a group of Dominican lay women, mostly widows, in her, in her town, who served the poor and lived a life of prayer and penance. Of course, this was done during the time of the plague. There was a lot to do. Um, so at 16, she takes the habit in the white veil of the mantelada. And then, I love these pictures. Now we're getting into the real Catholic medieval stuff. Um, for the next three years, Catherine gave herself over to prayer and self-discipline. She had a cell in the Benincasa in her, her family home um, and stayed there. And during this period, like as with many medieval, medieval saints, she was assaulted by temptations. Uh, evil thoughts, trying to stay in a state of contemplation forever. I mean, St. Anthony of the Egypt, of Egypt, St. Anthony of the Desert, and the other monks of Agrius, Cassian, talk about this kind of, um, they call it the noonday demon, when they're trying to stay at their prayers around noon is when the devil comes and begins to tempt them in all kinds of ways. So she is tempted, of course, one of the temptations is to take a husband and have children. Uh, because that's what she's supposed to do as a young Italian woman. So exhausted and feeling abandoned, Catherine um, eventually overcame these thoughts by objectifying them. She's actually the first behavioral psychologist. You are not your thoughts. You, you can separate yourself from your thoughts. Um, she remembered that she was called by Christ to accept the bitter as the sweet to embrace her suffering, and Christ, when she asked why all of this was happening, Christ told her, if I had not been there with you, you would have found those thoughts um, pleasurable rather than repulsive. So even the fact that she got through it, she took as an indication that Jesus was with her. Um, later, and, and it's later, before she dies, um, Catherine finally dictates to her secretaries the visions that she had as a young woman. Um, so she died at 33, so she never was much more than a young woman. Um, but she, uh, she had these visions in which God came, well, Christ came to her and spoke to her. Um, and these were things she carried with her throughout her life and then dictated at about the age of 30. OK, does everybody have a handout? So. Um, I am not my thoughts is one of her teachings, that being able to separate oneself from um, the, the temptations that come our way uh, and keep rooted in Christ is one of her teachings. Let's go back to self-knowledge. So what's up here you have on the first page of the handout? So I'm not sure we do. No, no you have, but you have the text. You have the text. You don't have the picture. Picture is just something I took of my 
camera on the, I learned this from the students. They don't take notes anymore. They just take their cell phones up to the board and take a, <laughs> click a picture. In seminar, we don't, I don't, you know, do lots of lecturing. We're at, ta we're at a seminar table, but, so I've learned from them if I take a picture, then I can just put it online for them. We uh, immigrants to technology yes. have to learn from me. <laughs> so, okay, so imagine a circle traced on the ground and in the center a tree sprouting up from it. This is her Augustinian imagination at work. Um, there's a shoot grafted into the side, a grafted branch, um, and the the tree finds its nourishment within the soil. These are all very organic images. Uprooted from the soil, it would die. So think of a, the soul as the tree. The tree made for love and living only by love. The, the roots are the tree's roots um, are love, and what the what the tree must grow in in order to flourish is self-knowledge. Um, knowledge that is joined to knowledge of God. So knowledge of God, true knowledge of self, is a, is a, a circle. And there's no getting out of it. Um, it's a continuous circle. So the first hermeneutic circle here. That's a um, so if, if knowledge of self is separated from knowledge of God, um, Catherine says, there would be no full circle, there would be a beginning in self-knowledge, but it would end in confusion. Again, in some ways a very modern uh, insight. So the tree is, the tree, um, is rooted in love, but nurtured in humility. So she has this very organic, um, very beautiful sense of, of what it is to, to become a full flourishing human being. The marrow of the tree is patience. We sometimes have to wait for God to, uh, you know, to learn what our, our sense of self is. But, but in a very Catholic way, she goes forward from that and says that this tree, when it's flourishing, um, moves out of, of uh, self-knowledge and God-knowledge towards charity, toward the love of God that's expressed to neighbors. Um, and those in need. So there's the fruit of the tree. The fruit of the tree is grace and um, expresses itself in love of our neighbors. So a very organic, very beautiful image um, that Catherine came up with to explain this unity of self and God and, and the fruits thereof. If, you know, if you have questions along the way, I, I knew we were going to take them at the end. I know you, and I know your wife, but tell me your name again. I mean, I know you. Phil You're Phil. Okay, thanks. So is there a second naivete, then, and as you go around the hermeneutical circle? A second? Naivete. Yeah, what do you mean? Well, you go through the critical self-analysis, the breakdown, but then you come back to a reconstructed reading where you see the texture of experiences in a new way. Like Augustine, you mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I think I think that's a fair analysis still because because of the fact that she had these visions, but she didn't dictate them until later. And so this is the mature, a more mature person. And, and at this point, as we'll see, in her 30s, she's trying to get the Pope to come back to Rome from France. I mean, she was the emissary. She was an amazing young woman. Um, so yes, I would say. Oh, yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. Can you repeat your questions? Say that again? Can you repeat the questions? Oh, the question to, from Phil? Yeah, He'll about, repeat it. Uh, in a hermeneutical circle, you kind of begin at a point and you come around, you analyze, break down, uh, you take apart the texture of the experience, then you come back uh, and put yourself in a fresh new experience called the second naivete, where you kind of look at it. Is that a fair Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice to have a colleague here. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> for me. Okay, so we talked about the visions. Okay, so he, we'll go back to her temptation now. Um, even though she's been rooted, she feels in God and had these visions, as Phil was saying, she's still going to have to struggle a bit. I am not my thoughts. Okay, so at this point, after, after these temptations, 
she later recalled that the Lord told her um, that she's going to have to endure suffering in many forms. Most of us humans come, have to come to realize. Um, but I never give up trying to make you like me insofar as you are able to be like me. I try to create within your soul, in this life, Christ said, what took place in my soul, in my life. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings. It's so medieval with Christ reaching out to Catherine, and then Catherine and the Virgin, and Christ beating up the devils, and some kind of an angel of uh, Catherine reaching out to a knight with an angel there, and then um, also, uh, I think that's the, Mike, uh, Michael um, slaying the dragon over in the right hand corner. So you have Catherine's in a long line of people who've just been slaying evil. So her intimacy with Christ during this time really intensified, and Catherine um, began to converge her prayer around that charity that we saw in the tree. In the tree. Her love of other people had, that, that um, Christ had, and perfect faith. That became her one prayer. She wanted such perfect faith that she would be able to love others with a pure heart. And there's Christ again reaching out to Catherine. This is um, Giovanni de Paolo. So uh, the next stage is, of course, mystical marriage to Christ, because she wanted to be um, un united with Christ and not to have a temporal marriage. And so on Mardi Gras, when she's 20, um, she has a vision of a wedding ring made of Christ's flesh, which joins her to him. Um, and on another, on another so she becomes his bride. Bride of Christ, and then on another occasion, that's not enough just to get his ring of flesh. Christ brought back her heart. She had prayed, to, she wanted to give Christ her heart. So Christ comes back um, and br brings back uh, the heart, but it's his heart, not hers. So they have this exchange of hearts, uh, which you can see here in the painting. From now on, she felt that she was to love others with Christ's own heart. Now, this is an unlettered woman, a very simple woman. And these are simple images in some ways, but they, they really speak um, beautifully to the, I think, the Christian experience of growing closer to Christ. In the dialogue, she writes, the soul is united with God, following in the steps of Christ crucified. And through desire and affection and the union of love, Christ makes of her another himself. Just a simple question here, but do you think she understood this like heart exchange and the ring exchange metaphorically, or was she being more literal in her? Yeah, you know, it's hard to, I mean, never having had mystical visions myself, yeah. it's hard yeah. to, but, but, you know, I think she felt that these visions were real. And often, um, during there's a wonderful book called uh, by Carolyn Bynum, a historian called um, no, she, um, I'm forgetting the title. But anyway, she talks about medieval women's experiences, and these visions sometimes came after days of fasting, right, and eating only the host. Um, and so whether the, that's and, and Catherine did obviously do a lot of fasting and penance, so that could have been um, part of what brought about this, and I'm sure there have been psychological and psychiatric analyses of all of this. Um, but she, I think, felt them as, as real, um, as Julian of Norwich did, right? But, um, and Hildegard, and many of these visionaries. Um, but then when, when she translated them, they became, of course, metaphors. Um, one fault, and maybe you're going to talk about this if we are, I don't want to distract okay. you now, but for Protestants, this idea of, mer of being the bride, and we've talked about the church as the bride of Christ, right. but the, being a nun as the bride of Christ seems kind of, you know, can, are you going to say a word about that, or can you tell us in a couple words more what that means to Catholics, uh, particularly in that period, or, because they still, I mean, nuns still talk about it. they were a ring, right. and that, and that's, not part of our tradition's experience. Right. Um, well, we're going to get to the popes okay. of it. No, we're going to get to the popes of, and you'll see. You know, I wanted to put hello, Mr. Luther, in there because yeah. all the indulgences and 
um, and, and everything. But, um, you know, I think it is simply that one um, gives up the, the life of, tries to give up the life of the world and, the, the, and rather than the call, the call to, um, to, the, to human marriage and to fleshly marriage is transformed through marriage to Christ into a higher spiritual marriage. I mean, I don't know if that's straightforward yeah. Catholic theology, but that's how I, I, I understand it. Okay, here's another, the exchange of hearts. She gets Christ's heart um, from the same artist, um, Giovanni Di Paolo. Uh, her experiences seem to have destined her for a life of contemplation. We've just been talking about all this three years in her cell in prayer. But one day, Christ supposedly, because she says in the, in the vision, positioned himself outside of the door of her cell in her house and told her to come out. Uh, the service you cannot do me, you must render your neighbors. So she's called to, to exercise uh, the fruits of that charity specifically um, through, uh, through virtue, through virtuous service to her neighbors. So for the next 13 years, that is what she did. You can see the beggar in the corner there, giving him a cloak. Um, this is an image of the plague from the Middle Ages. Um, it's dinner time, Christ said, go and join them. I love that. So go out, and um, the feast really is the fruit of this, the, these years of penance and contemplation are to engage the world. So she nursed her, her family, her father, and then um, nieces and nephews, all of whom were dying of the plague. Uh, that was her first act of, of charity. From there, she um, went to, to hospitals and also counseled sinners, mothers of violent sons, you know, quarreling families, Wives of cheating husbands. All so not only was she um, was she expend, extending her um, her charity as a nurse and in a kind of physical care for others, but also through counseling. Um, and her sister-in-law and then an aristocrat eventually joined her in that. Um, so this is this is one of those things where you wonder if she's an is this a picture of an anorexic or is this a was this death? Was this anorexia? Is this love at its most intense level? Um, she had an experience, an out-of-body experience, where she felt that she saw the, the hidden things of God, but God wasn't ready to take her. And she was thrust back into the prison of the body. Typical mystical experience of, from this time. Um, Julian of Norwich had a number of these. Hildegard of Bingen as well. So she's back in her body, and it's 1309. Um, I, I love this painting. Here's Catherine leading the Pope um, to Avignon. Uh, or I, I, guess, I don't know if she's trying to lead him back. I'm not really sure what the background is. But the two, I don't know if they're angels or apostles up at the top. Um, so the church splits, and... Pope Clement leaves Rome for Avignon in Provence, and the exiled church is called Babylon. People were upset with it for its many excesses. Financed by the sale of indulgences. Did you know that Benedict brought back indulgences? We Catholics are lucky enough that we can now take years off of purgatory again, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> well, we have, but he's gone. We have Francis now, so there's a little hope, trickle of hope there. Um, okay, so the church is divided, and the papal legates from France um, were trying to rule the city states of Italy. So the French and Italians have never quite understood each other, <laughs> and it didn't work out very well. So Florence in 1375, Florence is a state unto itself. It declares war against the papacy, and in um, Rome, it's Gregory the Gregory the, the 11th, 
and it's joined by many other um, city-states. This is Catherine, it's just a bishop, but that, he, this is supposedly her canonization, so that's why she's laying in there. Okay, so Catherine appeals to Gregory to return, sorry, I, I said Gregory was in Rome, Gregory is in France. Gregory to return to Rome and begin to make clerical reform there and make peace. Um, but where, wherever she goes, she's doing confessions, she has to have all these, or she's being, um, she's being approached to, to have confessions heard, and she has to have all these priests attend her. So by now she's become a very famous young woman and um, appealing to the, directly to the popes. This is a statue of Catherine um, in the uh, St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. Uh, she, Gregory returns the papacy to Rome, but dies, and then Pope Urban VI manages it badly. You see, you know, history just repeats itself, right? Um, and the cardinals elect a new pope, another Clement, um, but um, Urban's and Urban's explosive temper caused. So we have we have Urban and we have Clement. We have two popes, and many people switch alliances to Clement VII. At this point, Catherine is in Rome. Um, she's trying to work out the uh, negotiations between the two sides of these two popes. And she suffered a stroke at this point and uh, spends her last days in the church. And this is a famous kind of painting icon of, um, of Catherine. She's pray she um, has another experience, a vision, praying before uh, a mosaic of the scene 1422 from Matthew's Gospel in which the disciples are in the ship. During a storm, in Christ walks toward them across the water, and Peter is panicking, and well, they're all panicking, they're frightened, and Peter walks toward Christ, um, starts to fall, to drown, and Christ rebukes him for his lack of faith. So Catherine, um, during, ha in front of this mosaic, has a vision in which she sees the church as a ship, right, the ship, and sh the ship is... Um, has been lifted out of the picture in the mosaic and placed on her shoulder, uh, the full weight of it. So she's collapsed at this point, carried home, and um, has lost the, the use of her legs. She dies soon after, at the age of 33, on April 29, 1380. So why is Catherine a saint? Thought I'd say something about this. Um, I'm sure many of you know, the Christian, in the Christian context, saint comes from hagios, the Greek hagiazo, which means to set apart, to sanctify, or to make holy. And as um, saint didn't refer to deceased persons in the, in the apostolic, I mean, in, the, in the gospels, um, it was really living persons who had dedicated themselves to God. But as the church developed, in the centuries after Christ, um, the word saint was reserved for Christians who were exemplary um, in faith, hope, and charity. They were revered by their local churches and then eventually through canonization um, by Christians everywhere. But my favorite definition of a saint actually comes from William Blank. We are put on earth for a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. So becoming a saint means conforming ourselves more and more to God, putting off the old and putting on Christ, who is love. Bearing the beams of love. Um, that's a beautiful uh, definition of what it is to be a saint. So she was canonized in 1461 and became a doctor, teacher of the church in 1970. As a woman in the Catholic Church, it's nice to know that even though there, um, we are excluded from many things, we are nevertheless teachers of the faith and considered capable of that. Teresa of Avila was also named by Paul VI at the same time as a, a teacher of the church. Okay, are you ready? It's my little fun for the day. She may be dead, but you can still visit her in Siena. Because not only is she a saint, but she's an incorruptible saint. There she is. In one of these side altars, you walk up and there's her head.
This is the, uh, <coughs> the church in Siena. Um, and there's her. Um. So, okay, what is this? This is a miraculous phenomenon. The human body is not subjected to the natural processes of decomposition. So, this is not mummification. Nothing's been done to these, except that through the divine will of God, these bodies are not, um, uh, are not, do not decompose. If you've read the Brothers Karamazov, there's a <laughs> wonderful scene in there where Zosima's body is decomposing and all the monks think, oh no, he's not a saint, he wasn't a holy man during the whole time that he lived. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing. But, so you can go see her. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being such a good audience. Questions? Yes. I'm supposed to get up and do the button. <laughs> do the what? Oh, the back, question. back your hand out has Christ the Bridge. Oh, uh, yeah, Christ the Bridge. Another one of her lovely teachings, the three steps to... Uh... Was she there? She was not. Um, eventually, she learned to read and write. Again, this is one of those... She tried to teach herself to read by letters, tried to teach herself the alphabet. <coughs> and um, she couldn't, but then all of a sudden she was given the gift of reading. But that's why she dictates so much. Yeah. She wasn't really aware of it. Go ahead. So in my other life, I'm a psychologist. Uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and for many years, uh, I directed eating disorder program in West Virginia. There's a book called Holy Anorexia. Right. It speaks about St. Catherine. Mm -hmm. And she was pretty incredible in terms of denial of self and some of the gnarly things that she did in terms of, of self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned the vision she had after fasting, I mean, she, she would go to the extreme of drinking pus, uh -huh. as described in this book. So I just say that to say that she really was pretty extreme. Oh, extreme, very extreme, extreme. extreme. The other thing I would say too, just back to your comment about our thoughts are, their thoughts are really very contemporary in terms of psychological thinking, and it's a concept I use a lot. There's concepts. Our thoughts are not they're we are separate. Not our there are things of right. thought, thought acts and fusion is one of the right. concepts that. Thoughts are not action, they are not, they're thoughts. They're not determined. So in that sense, right on. Mm -hmm. But it's a good book, and it's it's by Bell. Hey, yeah. hey. And I can't remember if it's Ron or Robert. It's one of the many books that I have that I lent out and never got back. I it was an response. Um, Carolyn Walker Bynum's book, I just remembered, Holy Feast, Holy Famine. But from an historian's point of view, looking at the same phenomenon, and Catherine's in there. Thank you for your comments. A very interesting, thank you. Um, I have a question about the social process at the time of how does a, a woman, a young woman like her, gather such a following? You talked about um, you know helping people who are suffering from the plague, mm -hmm. but you know I can imagine there were a lot of people helping people. Right. Or was that so outstanding? I what think, are the other yeah. social? How does how does she be? get this huge following. Was she telling her visions at the time? Um, How does that happen? She had a, con she had a confessor um, who uh, was a Dominican priest. So she was very much a part of this large Dominican order. And, and from what I know, that's how her fame spread um, from, you know, from being this simple woman in, um, in uh, Siena to, to having this incredible experience of being negotiator with the popes. So she was part of the Dominican order, um, Fra Tomasa, and then Fra, um, his name was Ronaldo, who was her confessor, were uh, people who knew of her visions. She'd confessed them, but they weren't written down yet until, until later. So I think that's, that is how her fame spread. Is the word oblate that you were looking for yeah, earlier? For yes. In working with the sick and poor, I'm 
even though she kind of ran herself down by not eating well, she probably had a great immune system in drinking pus. <laughs> Horrible as that is, probably did stimulate that. And when people are sick, like like just when we get the plague, or or, or you know, if it, if everyone around you is dying, you're going to be running in the other direction. So there weren't many people that stayed and helped because if you did, you were dead. The same like when uh, the what was that bird thing that uh, yeah in Asia that took so many people so quickly and of course everybody runs because it's mm -hmm. you're fearful and back then they didn't even know what a germ was yes. so there was tremendous fear associated with that and I'm sure that gained her popularity yeah. just to follow up on that uh, Bill can maybe explain explicate this further but actually the willingness of the early Christians after Jesus and then Paul's time later when plagues were ravaging Rome and Roman citizens, even the wealthy fled the cities and often fled and didn't necessarily take care of their families or others. Right. Christians who were willing to nurse and care for um, people and because of that some of them survived and that gave Christianity the appearance of real miraculous powers mm -hmm. but it also it was a powerful community. <coughs> Yeah. And so from the earliest Christian times, there were some who did that when most of the non-Christian communities did not. But I'm sure in most of these settings, many people were afraid to do that too. But the real people who stepped up strongly influenced those around them by that act. Yeah, and you know, um, prior to uh, Catherine, another famous Italian Dante, um, has in mean, his divine media that there's hell where all the sinners are soloists basically in musical terms they 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 sing of their pen their penance and their sins alone but you get to purgatory right where all these purgations are going on where it's not as not quite as extreme as although some of them are pretty pretty extreme the uh, the avaricious have their eyes sewn shut because they were always were, were greedy and, and avarice for Dante is not just wanting what someone else has. You don't want him to have it. You want something bad to happen to him or her who has what you want. So there are there are the greedy carry big rocks on their backs and so forth. But the point is when you get the first image in Purgatory is of souls coming on a ship and they're singing and they're singing in in um, in unison and so. So you have choral music in the purgatory, communal music, and these angry soloists in, in hell. And it's always, every time I teach it, I'm just so overwhelmed by the, the music in purgatory. And then it becomes even more celestial. Of course, They're on their way up. Paradise. They're on their way up, up the mountain. That's right. Um, I wanted to just, um, you know, you, when we hear about someone like Catherine of Siena, um, it seems sort of very inaccessible. I think, um, but I think um, a person like her can point to. Um, I think I think mystical experiences are available to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was out at, at night tramping around Eastwood Park or Eastwood Golf Course, and it was a full moon, and the moon cast a shadow. It was so bright, and uh, there's something transcendent about that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just looking out the window oh, yeah. today, you know, or even, or, or it can be just, um, maybe you meet a person, maybe they don't even speak your language. I, I suspect this may have happened to some of our, I've not, I've not been to Tanzania yet, but I suspect it may have happened. There's all, yeah. there's, you just feel this sort of mystical connection with them. So I think mystical experiences are really available to everyone, or at least almost everyone. It doesn't have to be you know, self-levitation or images of Christ or exchanging hearts or things like that. So I don't know. Did, um, I agree with you. I think I think though that you know whether she was an anorexic and you know and engaged in self-flagellation and all kinds of awful things. Her teachings, I think, make those help to make those mystical experiences available to all of us. And one of the reasons. I love to teach Augustine and then just a little bit of Catherine is because I find that um, that
that inwardness is not something that is easily available in our culture. And that's really what she's teaching, right? Is that, is that you have an inner landscape, um, an inner geography, to, to borrow from Kathleen Norris. And, and that is something that needs to be developed and uh, it's a resource for life and for faith. Uh, it's not just about going to church. Because, let's face it, many of our young people are not, especially in Catholics, um, are not going to church. They're not finding what they need there. So, to, to have a sense that there are resources that can be developed within oneself, through prayer, through, um, through you know, reading, them, reading the Gospels, reading the Scriptures, etc., uh, is, is, helps, I think, make those mystical experiences available. But also these, you know, some of her teachings, the circle of self-knowledge. Um, so yes, I agree with you. We don't have to be caverns to have mystical experiences. Just a comment uh, for you to reflect upon. How do you think Catherine would view the need to display her thumb and her head? She was so inner in the connection. Mm. I, I don't think Catherine would have, um, obviously, this, the, the, nur the self is nurtured in humility, right? So that that's a part of, um, I had to throw that out there because it's just uh, such a crazy, um, crazy thing that, that the church still holds on to. Um, it's part of the whole pilgrimage, you know, um, tradition and veneration of, you have to see something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's, that's one of the, one of the, the first time. The first time I went to St. Peter, I actually was kind of shocked to see popes and boxes and things there. Um, <laughs> uh, and you walk in, you see the Pieta, which is amazing. Yeah. And then you go in further, and you see popes and boxes, and then you see statues around there, which actually is, felt to me at first very pagan, because it was like the kind of Greco-Roman world where you build mm -hmm. statues of you know around of all the people and. And uh, we were on the Franciscan leadership pilgrimage from, you know, to Assisi in Rome right. later, and went back to St. Peter. And at that point, I, the two things I missed it was a wonderful, wonderful experience and amazing. But to me, it struck me that in Catholicism, is a very, it's a very visual religion that has a lot of has relics, has it's, it's art. The incarnation it, is, it, is yeah, huge. It's everywhere. And right. what I missed from the Protestant tradition while I was on this wonderful pilgrimage was great preaching and great music. And and I think, you know, the homily as opposed to the mass and great music of the, you know, Bach and Handel and, you know, and all of that is a huge... Even Monteverdi, you know, yeah. I mean, let's, but, I mean there's, we never there's hear him in the The huge church. tradition no. of music and choral music right. and the church choirs around, our college choirs around here, yeah. it's huge, but Catholicism has we don't have the art that they have, so I don't. You, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but it just seems like it just struck me then as a as a very interesting difference. Yeah, I mean, obviously Luther, you know, those were were many of the things that he felt went along with the indulgences and the whole um, keeping people really away from. I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Luther, an expert on Lutheranism, so I'm speaking just as a lay person. Right, um, but uh, it's it, and it's interesting. The first time I read Luther, I felt like someone was screaming at me. Um, oh, he was. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. And with good reason. I mean, he had good reason. But um, but I think that that you know, as as in many religions, things get taken yes. taken too far. And in the in the Catholic tradition, um, you know, I I can't tell you. Uh, how disappointed I am in the level of homilies. I have an aunt who's a sister of mercy, and she says, to, I was complaining to her over Christmas, and she said, you know, I just want to say to these guys, what have you been doing all week? <laughs> <laughs> and um, because the, the homily is, is sometimes just, it, it's not teaching us about the scriptures, it's not teaching us, it's not doing nearly what it could do. In terms of music, you know, I agree. Um, I'm not sure what music. I think 
is still present in the Catholic tradition. I'm not sure how why it's gotten lost in the parish to the extent it has. That's a really good question. Or why it's in um, in Malibu, <laughs> which yes. is where Pepperdine is. Know, I've been there yet. Okay, yeah. so the church, my church is okay, imagine Gidget yeah. on a surfboard on, on, a, on a little <laughs> lean-to roof, right? Our Lady of Malibu. That's my church. And the first time I went to the, there's an 8.30 and then there's a, an 11. The 11 o'clock mass, I'm looking around, they're drums. They're drums, I mean, like it's a rock band. <laughs> and it's, it's um, very, very contemporary, but every single service is very contemporary. It's just muted. First there's, they get you ready, you know, at the 8.30 it's just the piano and the, um, the little bit of the choir. Oh yeah, and then they roll up to the drums. The students come. So, um, you know, why that has become associated with the mass to be, make it contemporary and has lost lots of the tradition I'm not. I grew up in a mostly Catholic neighborhood with a few Protestants around a parish near us. And after, Vatic after Vatican II, my, all our little Catholic friends came up to us and said, Ooh, we had to in church. They we were learning, so we had to sing these hymns. You know, so we were just it was just kind of fun. But I wanted to comment on the art part. Yeah. And what and, and what that why that's you think the incarnation you mentioned. I that. think so. And Anne wants to add, add to this. Go ahead. I did nine years of parochial school, and um, the the mindset is paternalistic. It is, I own this art on the wall, and this is my gold chalice, and this is, this is the church's thing, where music is something that comes from people and is shared. Um, and I was struck by that too when I went to Rome, that as a little kid, they, they banged you all the time for an, you know, you had to give your, your allowance away to these poor children in Africa. And when a very young girl, babies. I went to, to Rome, <laughs> and I looked around and I said, you guys got all the gold cups in the world. Why didn't you give them to Africa? What, what's the deal here? It was very distressing, you know. And, and it's distressing for many Catholics, I mean, as you know. It's, as a Catholic woman, it's been a, a real challenge to stay. Well, I want to say that there is an incredible body of rich Catholic music, and we definitely dip into it. So uh, there are some great Catholic choirs as well. So it's uh, it, it's there to be recovered. But I think just to to, to, Ruth. Ruth. Okay. Um, to, to answer Ruth's question, I think that, and you see this in Flannery O'Connor. I mean, even though she's another extreme in terms of at least her writing, not necessarily her personal life. But you know, to be. Um, for us to be connected to Christ, we need to be connected to Christ through Christ's humanity. And that is through the incarnation. And the incarnation means things that we can touch and what our senses can appreciate. And so I think art is really um, one of the means through which that becomes expressed. Great, and there's some reading on the back of your handout with this image of the bridge. Do you want to? Take the last two minutes and to yeah. just mention that. Because I don't have it on the slide. Can I borrow somebody? Give it back. Here. Oh. Christ the Bridge. Um, so another image, and a lot of she has an image of a fountain. These are things that come really from her. Uh, talk, we're talking about the incarnation, from her experience in the world, um, from rivers and um, bridges. So the notion is that we are drowning in sin in a river. We need a bridge to get across. Christ is the bridge, the mediator. Um, three steps to the bridge. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember what the steps are. Um, I know that it's confession. I think it's sort of the three steps of confession, confession, contrition, and absolution. Um, So, I really don't have a whole lot else to say except that it's a, another beautiful image of, of, of love and of Christ as, as an actual physical bridge that we cross um, to keep us grounded in 
and Christ's humanity as well as his divinity. Thank you for coming, Jane. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And next week is Sister Ingrid on Claire of Assisi. And one of the things she said to me on the phone that came out of our discussion today is she said, well, really, anyone can have a mystical experience. So we'll hear from her next week. And you can see Claire's body, too, in Assisi. <laughs>